and we have to reduce it, they said. Two tons every person we have to reduce to make sure that uh, we survive in this world. But this is the man he follows principally. He public transport he uses. By that he saves about 0.9 tons of carbon footprint. And also bicycle from there he uses it. And his food is purely vegetarian and all this thing, small amount he takes it. From that he is almost 0.9%. Nearly two tons he always saves it. From the institute he comes in a bicycle. And this is the way. I think he is the man with certain values, what he preaches, he practices. I call him the carbon footprint man of the DHS Center for this. Sir, I have great pleasure giving an invitation to you for the interview. Please officially welcome the people. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. Uh, so welcome you all to this uh, monthly seminar we have, which uh, Dr. Parmesh has organized for the last two years on issues related to health and the environment. And we heard many eminent speakers talk about various issues. And uh, <clears throat> today we have a very special speaker to talk about uh, impact of environment on skin disorders, and which is a very important issue, which many of you may not be aware. So uh, on behalf of Professor S.K. Satish, who is the chairman of the DOJ Center, I invite Dr. Satish uh, to our seminar and I request Dr. Paramit to introduce the speaker. Thanks. So I also try to say, share with you that uh, the president of uh, international Commonwealth countries, he just called up uh, this uh, morning. He said, Dr. Paramesh is very hard time, 2 a.m. for me. <laughs> He's in USA. Very difficult to understand. But if you record this one, please, YouTube, I like to that's all the 52 countries I'll share in this one. Anyway, who are all on the people uh, in the in the web? I welcome good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night for everybody. So I think this will be shared. And also, with your permission, we like to uh, record it. YouTube, we like to put it with your permission. Yes. Okay. I think they talk about this subject. And uh, I like to just giving the brief. I just want to highlight that. So your environment affects the skin condition, including the genetics, hormones, uh, and also diet where you live to work. There are three organs in our human body that are directly exposed to the environment. One is eye and the respiratory tract. Second, the gastrointestinal tract through the mouth. Third is the skin, predominantly. Definitely, it has got the greatest impact, all these things. There are skin and lung are interrelated. Gut and lung, they're all interrelated. All as they go to the lungs, primarily going to affect it through these organs. Then other organs will be uh, affected. The environment, uh, air pollution, our poor nutrition has been associated with the skin allergy, atopic dermatitis, eczema, and uh, psoriasis, acne, and uh, skin aging. The sun radiation, ultraviolet radiation, infrared radiation contribute to this skin aging and cancer of the skin predominantly. And the environmental stress factors for skin are pollution, secondhand smoke, ultraviolet radiation, harsh weather, and free radicals break down the collagen and damage the skin. Skin and liver are closely related, being organisms organs of elimination, including the kidney also comes later on. Psoriasis is a chronic inflammatory multifactorial skin disorders with a global prevalence uh, varies from 0.09% to 11.43%. I think it's as in BMJ 2020 has published at that time. So to talk this important subject, we have with us none other than Professor D.A. Satish. He did his MBBS and MB in all Institute of Medical uh, Science in, in New Delhi. And he has done his uh, FA, a Fellow of American Academy of Dermatology, United States of America, uh, Fellow of Royal College of uh, uh, Physicians in Glasgow. And uh, he is Senior Consultant Dermatologist, Sagar Hospital, Bangalore. 
and the skin cosmetic and ENT care center, uh, formerly assistant professor of the MS Ramaya Medical College, our neighbor here, Bangalore. He is the founder and former president of the Bangalore Dermatological Society, former vice president of the IADVL, that is Indian Association Dermatologist, Venereologist and Leprologist. He is the former president of the same thing in the Karnataka State Branch. And also a special in, his special interest is in clinical dermatology, acne and aesthetic dermatology. Several publications he has done it in the National International Journal, peer-reviewed journals. With a Master Dermatologist Award for the Best Academic Practicing Dermatologist of Karnataka State in 2015, National Best Practicing Dermatologist Award for South Zone in 2018, and the Economic Times Doctors' Day Inspiring Dermatologist of India Award in 2021. And more than that, he's a man with certain values. If you want to say anybody in Bangalore who is a no nonsense doctor of dermatology, Satish, everybody says about it. And with a great pleasure, he's so busy with all these things, he could be able to come over here. Even to get an appointment, you have to wait many months. Sometimes we phone him up, we will just adjust in between. So, anyway, we are very grateful for you. Come over, sir. I will hand you over to you so that uh, to hear your comments on the your knowledge of what we can share with this one, psoriasis and uh, environmental issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, and uh, for your wonderful words. And uh, first of all, I would like to. Uh, thank uh, the DHI Center for Climate Change, Indian Institute of Science, the Comad UK, and the National Chapter, uh, Comad UK National Chapter, and the Lakeside Education Trust for inviting me today for this uh, program. And my talk will be on environmental issues uh, to prevent uh, chronic skin disorders with focus on uh, psoriasis. So this is where I practice. It's uh, my clinic in Jainagar. First of all, I put up this slide because uh, Dr. Parmesh is my mentor. And when I came from to Bangalore from New Delhi after passing my MD at Ames and joined MS Ramaya College, the first place I started my practice was at Lakeside Medical Center in hospital. So when I uh, approached him, I still remember October 1984, uh, Lakeside was the top hospital in Bangalore at that time. I stood, I stay in Jayanagar. I used to go to North Bangalore, but I still wanted to practice in East Bangalore because that was the prime hospital of the East, uh, Bangalore at that time. There were no other corporate hospitals. I approached him with my CV and he just had a look and he spoke to me for five minutes and said, Satish, you can start coming from tomorrow. <laughs> so, that was the first place. So I, I owe a lot to Professor Parmesh because that, that's he gave me the uh, the baby footsteps from which I was able to grow to this much. And from 1984 till 2000 AD, I was attached to Lakeside Medical Center. That's almost 16 years in addition to my practice. So I always uh, am indebted to you, sir. And uh, one thing I wanted to tell is most of the uh, uh, doctors uh, of uh, senior doctors in Bangalore and eminent doctors of Bangalore have passed through Lakeside. That is uh, including Professor Mahadevaya, the ENT specialist who passed away some time back. So from him to uh, say Dr. Naresh Bhatt, etc. I can quote a lot of uh, names. So most of them have passed through Lakeside and then they have risen to the top. So. I think Dr. Parmesh has a lot of role. Even now, when we meet in uh, the so social gatherings, we all get together and reminisce those days. So, uh, uh, we, and even now, th those doctors refer cases to me, and we, I refer cases to them. That's the sort of bond we were able to build up at Lakeside Hospital. So, so that's why in the beginning I wanted to thank uh, and remember this before I proceed uh, further. You have a pointer. Yeah, is there?
So global climate changes, as you all know, uh, has an impact on average and uh, peak temperatures. It has an impact on humidity, atmospheric pressure, precipitations, wind patterns are all altered. The ocean pH and salinity is affected and it leads to melting of glaciers. So global warming, the average global temperatures on Earth have increased by at least 1.1 Celsius since 1880. And the global temperature is projected to warm by about 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2050 and by say 2 to 4 degrees centigrade by 2100. So the 11 warmest years this century have all occurred since 1980, with 1995 being the warmest on record. And this year you have seen how uh, the heat has affected Europe, US, and for the first time after several years, you are seeing drought in Europe, especially in Spain. And temperatures have gone up to 40 degrees, uh, which they have never seen in their lifetime. So that's the effect of global warming. And this Paris Agreement on Climate Change was held on December 2015. And these were the world leaders who attended that. They set out a global framework to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees centigrade and pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees. And it's now ratified by about 193 countries, including the European Union, which comes to nearly about 200 countries now. And they have a goal to reduce their emissions to net zero by 2050. In the COP26 conference, that is the 26th conference of parties that signed the Treaty of uh, United Nations Framework Convention, on climate change in 1994, our own Prime Minister Narendra Modi grabbed headlines at the COP26 uh, conference in Glasgow, where he announced that uh, India would achieve net zero emissions by 2017, 2070. And everyone was surprised by it, and uh, we hope we'll be able to achieve it by 2070, but I don't know how uh, exactly uh, things will proceed. So let us look at what global warming leads to. Global warming causes evaporation of more water, leading to drying up of the soil. It increases water in the atmosphere, so more rain. More, the more rain leads to more flooding, snow, landslides, erosion of soil, which can lead to ca catastrophic uh, uh, attacks and deaths. And drought can occur in one part of the country because a rain is affecting the other part of the country, heavy rains. Global mean sea level has already risen by 4 to 10 inches over the last 100 years as because water expands when it heated. The temperature goes up, the water expands. And one more reason for that is, of course, the melting of the glaciers, which leads to rebound increase of temperatures. And when there is a decay of organic matter, it leads to release of trapped carbon and methane. So I'm sure uh, this is uh, all very basic for you, but uh, for those who are uh, uh, they, in the, in the, uh, for those called the common man, the carbon footprint is the total amount of greenhouse gases, including CO2 and methane, that are generated by our actions. The average carbon footprint for a person in USA is 16 tons per year. So that is 16 tons, that is one of the highest in the world. Whereas globally, the av average carbon footprint is closer to about 4 tons, but in US, it's about 16 tons. Greenhouse gases in our atmosphere trap and release heat and contribute to climate change. So these are the top CO2 emitting countries in the world and you can see that USA tops the list. You can no longer call USA as a non-polluted country. It is tops the list of top CO2 emitting countries. Comes China next, Russia, Germany, United States, Japan and India is seventh in the list. The last is uh, surprisingly Iran. If you look at the uh, total greenhouse gas emissions and which sector emits more, sector wise, it's the transportation sector which emits the maximum, say 27%. We all know that uh, the aviation industry, the shipping industry, and the automobile industry, especially the automobile industry, which has a very strong lobby throughout the world, including the US, 
which does not allow any public transport in US at all, except in one or two cities. And that is responsible for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, 27%. Next comes the electric power, especially the coal emitting uh, power stations. The industries contribute next, that is about 24%. And we have a role also, the commercial and the residential uh, areas, which contribute about 13%. The least is the agriculture, which contributes about only 11%. So when we, uh, we have to have a closer look at these industries and try to reduce the emissions from these. I already said sea level rise is due to melting glaciers and rise of temperature in uh, sea water leading to expansion. And global average sea level rise between 1901 to 2018 is about 15 to 25 centimeters. And by 2050, the Pacific coast uh, rise will be about 4 to 8 inches, the Atlantic coast 10 to 14 inches, and the Gulf coast 14 to 18 inches. And this is what is going to happen because of that, cyclonic storms, flooding, destruction of the coast, and fragile wildlife habit habitats. This is a satellite picture of the same. The data source is NASA, which shows how the sea level is rising by the a decade and uh, per year it is now 3.5 millimeters per year. That is the sort of rise of sea levels we are seeing because of global warming and climate change. So which countries are at risk from sea level rise? 70 percent of the people who will be affected by rising sea levels are located in just eight Asian countries. So th almost three-fourths of the uh, people who are living in Asia will be affected. Amongst them, we have China, Bangladesh, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines and Japan. Worldwide, if you take uh, country wise, the worst affected will be Egypt. The Nile River is responsible for that. Then China, Bangladesh, Netherlands, the Bahamas, Brazil and Tonga. So these are uh, the six, uh, seven countries which may be worst affected in the world due to level, sea level rise. This is diagrammatically depicted here. You can see that uh, this is uh, the Asian countries involved here and here comes uh, India. So we have first China, Bangladesh and then India here. China, Bangladesh and India. This is the uh, Asian countries which will be affected. Most of the coastal countries will be affected. So there are, this is a prediction that these are the cities which may come under water by 2030. That is not far away, just eight years away. So we don't know what is going to happen in the next uh, eight years. We may not have these countries at all. They may be under water. Amsterdam, Netherlands, Basra in Iraq, New Orleans, USA, Venice in Italy. So if you're not visited these countries, better do so in the next few years. You may not be able to see them in, uh, after some time. In India, it will be Kolkata, Kal the coastal town, which will be underwater in the next uh, decade. Then you have Bangkok, Thailand, Georgetown, Guyana, and Savannah in Georgia, USA. These are the cities that could be underwater by 2030. So let us look at uh, the health hazards of uh, climate change. Climate change can lead to drought, floods, heat waves, wildfires, and other extreme events. So naturally, it will affect the social and environmental determinants of health. So uh, these the environmental determinants are the, we have to have a clean air, safe drinking water, sufficient food, and a secure shelter. This is what is needed for a good health. People in developing countries naturally with poor resources will be affected first. And the vulnerable sections of the society are always the children and the elderly. And they, they will be vulnerable to a lot of these diseases. And the economic impact it will have on the countries and the mental health issues which will affect the individuals can be quite devastating. So this slide uh, uh, depicts very well the impact of climate change on uh, human health. I've taken this slide on uh, uh, from the WHO website and uh, which uh, asked people to use it in their PowerPoint presentations. 
So let's, let us look at uh, these factors. The air pollution causes asthma, cardiovascular diseases. Climate changes in vector eti uh, uh, ecology leads to malaria, dengue, all the vector borne diseases, malaria, dengue, encephalitis, rift valley fever, Lyme disease, chikungunya, West Nile disease, etc. West Nile virus. When there's increasing allergens, then again you have respiratory allergies, asthma. So water quality impacts cholera and other uh, diseases like uh, leptospirosis, etc. And water and food supply when it is impacted, then malnutrition, diarrhea disease. Environmental degradation naturally leads to forced migration, civil conflict, conflict and mental health impacts. And there's extreme heat, heat related illnesses and death and cardiovascular failure. That's what you have. A lot of people are dying in Europe now, surprisingly. Then severe weather can lead to injuries, fatalities, mental health impacts, like I said. So these are all the uh, impact of climate, climate change on human health. So we, let us come to environment and skin. So as we all know, skin is the largest organ of the human body. It is not only a sensory organ, but also the first layer of defense from noxious agents entering the human body. And skin is the most exposed organ to environment. So everybody wants to have a very clear skin, a good skin, a clear complexion. So like the film stars, and no doubt the cosmetic industry is thriving. And today we are also in great demand and dermatology and radiology are the most sought after specialities for postgraduate residency. The etiology of uh, skin disorders is often multifactorial. Right? Two main factors are involved. One is the constitution, hereditary and genetic factors, and of course, the environmental factors. Let us look at the environmental factors and skin disorders. What do these environmental factors lead to? For example, for what, from water, we can get an irritant contact dermatitis, that is an eczema on, on the hands. Hand eczema was very common in the COVID season. Everyone, the dictum was to keep washing your hand and people washed so much and use so much of alkaline soaps that they came, came to us with uh, eczema on the hands. There should be a lot of online consultations during the lockdown period and later too. And we had to advise them to, yes, wash, but use, don't use the harsher soaps and wash less frequently. And uh, especially when people are susceptible, like when they have an atopic disorder. The ultraviolet rays, it can cause sunburn, which is a phototoxic reaction. It can cause photoallergic reactions. Everything under the sun, including the sun, can cause allergy. So people are surprised when I say, say that. How is it possible, doctor, they say. Polymorphous light eruption is very common in Bangalore too, because we are at a higher sea level and UV content is there. Atmosphere is more. Urticaria, reduced by uh, UV rays, it's called solar urticaria. And aging of the skin and skin cancers, as uh, Professor Paramesh was referring to. Not only heat, that cold also can affect the skin. It can cause, if you go to the mountains, the Himalayas, you can get frostbite. We have a very sensitive skin. We can have a cold urticaria. There can be flare up of some uh, collagen vascular disorders like systemic sclerosis, etc. The dust pollution in pollens can cause airborne contact dermatitis. In Bangalore, Professor Srinivasan was asking me, this, what was the disorder which is very common in Bangalore? In the 80s, we used to see a lot of Parthenium dermatitis, which was imported from Pune and from US it came to Pune. It's called commonly called the Congress grass. Gradually, people have developed an immunity to it, and now the amount of number of people coming with parthenium dermatitis, which is an airborne allergen, has become less. Flares of eczema, especially like atopic dermatitis, can occur due to dust, pollen, and pollution. pollution. So, this climate change can also lead to various other conditions. It can lead to skin infections. When it causes bacterial infections, you get boils on the skin. 
we get impetigo, that is another uh, infection. Cellulitis, where you get painful swellings. Fungal infections. Now there is a, almost a pandemic of fungal skin fungal infections going on in our country and in South Asia, which is extremely resistant to treatment. So extremes of weather, warm, humid climate, sultry weather, all leads to exacerbation of the fungus. They are called the tinea infections. Viral infections, you must have heard, pediatricians are extremely busy in the last two or three months. And there's a lot of hand, foot and mouth disease going, uh, spreading amongst children in uh, throughout the country, more in Bangalore and Karnataka. That's hand, foot and mouth disease is a viral infection caused by a coxsackie virus. Similarly, climate uh, change can lead to more of this uh, scabies, pediculosis, leishmaniasis, Lyme disease, etc. So mosquito-borne diseases, again, there's now a, uh, a lot of uh, dengue and chikungunya. This is the season, monsoon, where you can see a lot of this fevers, dengue, chikungunya, hand, foot and mouth disease and viral infection. A lot of variants of viruses are coming up. Warmer climates, more skin inflammation, it's not infection, leading to atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. And then skin aging and cancers, which I'll talk to later. So I've taken two prototypes of skin diseases to explain to you what are the, uh, how do they manifest and what are the triggering factors in those diseases and how do we diagnose and treat them. And one is atopic dermatitis, that is atopic eczema and the other is psoriasis. The atopic eczema is a very common inflammatory condition. It's associated with severe itching. The term atopy is an inherited allergic ten tendency. These individuals, genetically, they are predisposed to allergy and it runs in families. So it, this means that individuals born in these diseases can one have one or more of atopic disorders. When it affects the skin, it causes eczema. When it affects the respiratory tract, it can cause an allergy in the nose that's called allergic rhinitis. When it affects the lungs and bronchi, it's called the asthma. So this is an atopic condition where the respiratory allergies and the skin allergies can coexist. So it can manifest at three phases in life. During from birth to two years, it's called the infantile eczema when it occurs during the first two years. Two, two years to 12 years childhood, and beyond that is the adult or the, or the adolescent type of atopic eczema. So how does it manifest? When it starts off, it uh, manifests as uh, oozing eczema in the phase in infancy and childhood. And then as it progresses, then it uh, tends to remain confined to the in and around the joints. The skin becomes very dry and thick. We call it as lichenified skin. But the hallmark of the disease is severe itching. So it comes and goes, there is remissions and exacerbations. Just shown a few pictures. This is a typical manifestation of atopic dermatitis. It starts on the cheeks in infancy. Here, maybe if you switch off some more lights, uh, you can see better. Are you able to see the pictures? Yeah, can I have the fan, please, for you? Then they uh, also have this uh, eczema around the mouth. It's called the lip lick eczema or the perioral eczema. It's all uh, features of atopic dermatitis. It affects the eyelids. It's called eyelid dermatitis. So as it goes on, it becomes chronic and it goes into childhood and adult phase. Then the joints are affected around the joints. Thick skin around the joints, behind the knees, in front of the elbows. That's lichenified eczema. No, sir, not in eczema. In psoriasis, it will be. Okay. It will come. That's foot eczema. So when it starts uh, oozing, uh, then it becomes acute. So this is another variety of eczema which is associated with varicose veins. We call it as stasis eczema or stasis dermatitis. I was talking about photosensitivity. Here you can notice the eczema is confined to the outer aspect of the forearms. This is a typical photosensitive dermatitis. The hand eczema, this is the two varieties, which is very common in COVID. 
during the COVID season. So what are the triggers? Here the environmental factors come into play. Extreme climates, like uh, this condition can aggravate both in summer and in winter. In summer because of dry, arid weather, so sultry weather and very cold winters, which dries up the skin. And if the child is given prolonged bath, sometimes they feel that something is wrong with the skin. So let us give him, make him clean by giving bath three times a day. That's what aggravates the condition. The prolonged heart, hot baths, use of shower gels and medicated soaps. If okay, something wrong with the skin, let me use uh, uh, medicated soap. Uh, then it aggravates. So what we advise is use warm water, use mild soaps and cleansers, and uh, there's neutral pH soaps, which are called scented bars. We always tell these patients to avoid woolen clothes and woolen and synthetic clothes. So in, when they come back and ask what to do, in, what, what should we do in winter? And we tell them to, to dress up in multiple layers of cotton clothing, which keeps the child warm. So these are various other irritants like household cleansers, detergents, aftershave lotions, harsh soaps and solvents, which I mentioned, they can all act as triggers and aggravating factors in, in atopic eczema. And aeroallergens, the dust, the dust mites, pollens, air pollution can often trigger sneeze and wheeze in atopics. And what happens is it also impairs the skin barrier function, all these factors. When the skin barrier function is impaired, then it breaks out into eczema, it breaks, and it also develops secondary bacterial inputs. Pets with, which have a lot of hair and dander can often cause flare of eczema. And probably in respiratory allergies, they even ask them to avoid pets. But in atopic eczema, we, uh, it's like a psychological uh, uh, cure. They it's very soothing if they we don't advocate not to you have pets in atopic eczema if they we tell them they have pets without with less hair or no hair and no dander especially if they do not have respiratory symptoms sun exposure and outdoor sports so eczema is very bad and it's there all over the body we tell them wait wait for some time and once the, the eczema is well under control we allow them to go out and play so that they we, the purpose is that they live a near normal life. They're not affected by anything. They have to mingle with other children, participate in sports. They should not be isolated. They should not get psychologically affected. When there is a lot of infection with superimposed cephalococcus infection, which will, it will keep the eczema active. So we treat the infection first and then uh, send the patient out. Stress, when the child is facing an exam, I see a lot of these flares of eczema and psoriasis when between 10th, 11th and 12th standards. That is the worst period of a uh, adolescent's life. There's under so much pressure and so much of stress. I get uh, they're forced. The parents are forced to bring with aggravation of acne, eczema, psoriasis, everything. And stress plays a very important role, especially in those three uh, years where they're Maybe they're studying uh, 14 hours a day. So what happens to these eczema patients? What is the natural course of this uh, disease? So 90% of the patients experience the onset of disease prior to five years. Nearly three-fourths of them show marked improvement in the severity by the time they uh, reach 14 years. So that's a very good prognostic sign. So only about 20 to 25% pass on from childhood to the adult phase. So with relapses and in course of time, the atopic eczema in adulthood also comes down. This is a common word which is uh, used nowadays. It's called the atopic march, where patients can have one or more of these atopic disorders. The traditional or the classical sequence which is disturbed, uh, described is, first you get eczema, then you get asthma, and finally the allergy in the nose, the allergic rhinitis. So that is the atopic march, where the individual can have one or more of these three conditions, though it may not necessarily follow the same pattern. So how do we treat this condition? Moisturizers, moisturizers, moisturizers. It forms the mainstay of treatment. 
as we applied immediately after bath and the skin is still wet and as mentioned the various triggers we have to try to avoid them stress factors use topical steroids use non steroidal anti inflammatory agents like tacrolimus and pimecrolimus when the eczema becomes very bad we give them oral agents like oral steroids immunosuppressive agents like cyclosporin we have biologicals now monoclonal antibodies available uh, for atopic eczema severe we can give narrow band uvb phototherapy in selected patients and oral antihistamines to control the itching so from eczema let us let me talk a little about psoriasis so this is a chronic recurrent inflammatory skin disease it causes typical red scaly patches with silvery white scales it affects it can affect effect all over the body but very commonly the scalp elbows knees as over the joints and it can affect 1 to 3% of the population uh, parameshwar was telling in some countries it is up to 11% as you as you quoted it's that high in india it's about 1 to 3% but remember that both eczema and psoriasis are non communicable the first question the patients or the relate the parents ask is doctor it's going to spread to other children it's going to come to us it's going to come and we send them to school both these conditions are non not infectious it's not communicable the exact cause of this condition is not known but the skin shedding is so much it's four, uh, four times it keeps shedding in once in 3 to 4 days so there's lot of scales which are coming out of the skin it can be hereditary we get a positive family history of psoriasis in about only 10 to 15% of the patients so it's more likely to occur in people where family members have it but the most important factor is it's immune mediated factors which play a major role in pathogenesis triggers psoriasis aggravates in winter and cold weather and reduces in summer if there are cuts and wounds the patient gets then on those cuts and wounds psoriasis can occur it's called the cobner's phenomena so the patient has gone out for a holiday and has a sunburn it can that itself can trigger psoriasis if the patient gets repeated sore throat that is streptococcal streptococci it can often provoke the first attack of psoriasis we call that a condition as guttate psoriasis other triggers are some uh, medications can trigger psoriasis used for hypertension beta blockers used in psychosis lithium smoking alcohol consumption and obesity are definitely provoking and triggering factors and stress like i mentioned we talk a lot about psoriasis and metabolic syndrome nowadays where whenever a adult psoriatic patient comes or even if a child which is obese especially abdominal obesity we look for other comorbidities like hypertension type 2 diabetes insulin resistance high lipid levels and non alcoholic fatty liver disease this is called the metabolic syndrome if they have that we uh, advise lifestyle alterations to reduce and manage these conditions because there is a greater risk of both heart disease that is coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease strokes because of this condition the peak of psoriasis is 20 to 40 years and phase is often spared this is often a blessing in disguise in these patients so in addition to the skin it may affect the nails leading to pitting separation of the nail plate from the nail bed so these are some pictures for you to show this is a quite severe plaque psoriasis on the back and this is the resolving psoriasis psoriasis is improving here with treatment when it leaves behind marks psoriasis on the legs due to some herbal treatment it's become white but it this is not a manifestation of psoriasis and these are the lesions on the legs quite severe psoriasis it's very common in the palms and soles we call it as palm plantar psoriasis see how much the patient might be affected he can't walk it bleeds he can't go for a walk the patient can can not go for a walk and that itself leads to uh, increase in weight and other metabolic conditions sides of the feet affected with psoriasis these are some more uh, pictures of uh, psoriasis in the feet the palms quite severe affection of the palms 
this really impacts the day to day life the activities of daily living because uh, when the uh, person goes to the office he cannot shake hand with another person because of his psoriasis so it has a severe causes a severe psychological burden on the patient though it might be confined to the palms and soles we look at how much it is affecting his day to day living and treat accordingly this is scalp it's just not dandruff you get very thick scaly plaques on the skin so whenever a patient says doctor i have dandruff which is not at all going we look whether and see whether the patient has psoriasis or not so one of the complications of psoriasis is it can become red and scaly throughout the body we call it as erythrodermic psoriasis where it affects the skin starts peeling in the entire body so this was a patient with severe erythrodermic psoriasis i was able to bring him under control within one month we had to go to us i put him on methotrexate which is a immunosuppressive drug and within four weeks he was better and he went to his son's house in us the same patient with severe scaling on the limbs and this is one condition which can cause arthritis too it's called the psoriatic arthritis it can occur in 7 to 10% of patients the small joints of the hand hands feet wrist shoulders back these are the joints which can be affected it may be mild to severe and can be disabling sometimes with severe deformities but fortunately it is less common in india the psoriatic uh, joint involvement is less common in india but it is very common in the west we had a lot of patients with psoriatic arthritis in us but not in india so i mentioned erythroderma is one of the complications sometimes pus can accumulate sterile pus can accumulate it's called pustular psoriatic psoriasis and then psoriatic arthritis so what is the natural course of this condition it's a recurrent condition it has remissions and exacerbations but it can vary from person to person a person can go into remission for several years it may not come at all after 5 years 6 years suddenly it can come back so the aim of treatment is to give a good remission and a good quality of life to the patient so how do we treat this condition general measures lose weight if obese avoid smoking alcohol control the comorbidities hypertension diabetes and the lipids we advise yoga and meditation to avoid stress and discontinue triggering medications if any then we have the topical medication that is the moisturizers emollients keratolytics coal tar preparations topical uh, steroids and vitamin A, d derivatives like calcipotriol and we have the oral agents methotrexate cyclosporine and immunosuppressive drugs we also have a oral retinoid called acetretin we use it depending upon how severe the disease is we give uvb phototherapy we have biologicals to treat psoriasis now the burden of psoriasis it severely affects the quality of life can lead to severe anxiety depression suicidal tendencies the economic burden to the patient family and country is quite high and definitely we need a lot of passion and compassion to manage these patients we have to spend a lot of time with these patients especially on their first visit because they would be going from doctor to doctor and explain the condition then only they'll be happy otherwise they will try to find a cure for psoriasis which they cannot let me look at some more factors environmental factors that affect the skin so i'll talk about skin and the sun so what are the short term and long term damages the sun can cause the skin it can cause sunburn like i said if you go on a holiday you can burn if you are exposed the patient will come back and say doctor i went to the mountains the temperature was only 5 degrees why am i sunburned so it's not the infrared rays which burn it's the uv rays which is causing the burn so if you go to any um, mountains if you go to ocean the reflected radiation is more when the reflected radiation is more the uv content in the atmosphere increases and you tend to sunburn so even if they go out to the himalayas or to the mountains to the ocean it ask them to cover them up as much as possible use uh, protect protective headgear and sunscreens so it can cause uh, photo, uh, light eruptions like i showed in one picture it can cause pigmentary disorders on the skin 
like freckles, lentigens. There are conditions called melasma, other facial melanosis, LPP. It can cause increase in the number of moles, aging of the skin. Uh, dry, uh, aging of the skin manifests as dryness, wrinkles and sunspots and skin cancer. That's uh, pigmentation of the skin and the neck. We call this condition as uh, lichen planus pigmentosis. Very common condition in middle age melasma. So let, let us look at uh, environmental and skin cancers. Three common skin cancers are the squamous cell carcinoma, the basal cell carcinoma and the melanomas. So what is the difference between skin cancers in the USA and India? According to American Cancer Society, skin cancer is the most common of all cancer types in the US. And more than 3.5 million people are diagnosed with skin cancer every year in the USA. And that is more than all other cancers combined together. That's quite a high figure. So how do you prevent it? How do you detect it early? It's by self-examination, by regular checkups with doctors whenever there are suspicious lesions. But in India, in, in the tropical countries, the skin cancers are very less. The amount of cancers we see is very less because we have the dark skin and the dark skin, the natural melanin protects us from the cancer. So that's a great advantage we have. Having dark skin, don't get uh, uh, disturbed because the natural melanin is protecting us from skin cancer and early skin aging. You see a person from the West, you can see that they are taking Botox and fillers for wrinkles and skin aging in the 30s. But in India, a man or a woman, even in 50s, is not aged much on the skin of the face. That's because of the melanin which we have, which is protecting us. So these are some uh, cancers which uh, come to my clinic. This is squamous cell carcinoma. This is a basal cell carcinoma. And this is a basal cell carcinoma in an elderly on the forehead, which is biopsy prone. And then it was operated, it was removed, and then uh, with a flap, it was sutured, and this was the end result, and it was cured, it didn't come back. So basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma can be treated when diagnosed early, and it's not spread to other floats or other areas. Skin and the sun. That's a repeat slider. How do you protect yourself from harmful effects of the sun? That is UV radiation. So when you go on a holiday, when you are out in the sun, if you have, don't want to burn, you don't want to get a sun tan, or you don't want to get a light eruption, then please use cap and wide-brimmed hats. Wear sunglasses. Cover exposed areas with full-length clothes. Use light colored, tightly woven clothes, preferably cotton clothes. Always use sunscreens. And if possible, try to stay in the shade as much as possible. And especially avoid peak UV radiation hours, that is between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And the West is very fond of tanning beds, unlike us. So there is great uh, uh, emphasis on avoiding tanning beds in the West. So how to choose and use these sunscreens? Remember that it has to be used every two to three hours when you are outdoor on all exposed areas and apply about 10 to 20 minutes before stepping out and use broad spectrum water resistant non comedogenic sunscreens. You can use sunscreens in children. You can use the physical sunscreens which contains like zinc and titanium dioxide. Use even if you are at home to protect from visible light. Now, your visible light also uh, is known to increase some uh, existing disorders. So we tell them to use sunscreens even at home. These are the myths about sunscreens. It protects 100% from sun. No, it doesn't. You just apply sunscreen and uh, go with a half shirt. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't work because sunscreens protect you only about 30%. You have to cover up as much as possible with full sleeves and uh, wear a hat. It causes sans cancer, definitely not, it doesn't. It prevents skin from synthesis of vitamin D3. 
They say I got a vitamin D3 test done. My levels are very low. I want to walk around in the sun for two hours a day. But do you advise them and they come back with a tan or a sun allergy? This is wrong because the amount of vitamin D3 synthesized in the skin is less even without sunscreen. And majority of the Indian population are vitamin D deficient. Though we are at, in a tropical country and we have so much of skin, sun, we are vitamin D deficient because that shows that skin is not the main source of vitamin D synthesis. And majority of us will need supplements at some point of our life. So these are some myths about sunscreens, which I wanted you to know about. So how do you manage your skin in the winter? Harsh low temperatures can, will cause dry skin, cracking of the skin, and you get a lot of uh, cracks in the soles, feet, fissuring of the skin. And young children, elderly will lose oil, that is the sebum of the skin, content in the skin, and they are prone for eczemas. We call them as xerotic eczemas. Remember that air conditioning and central heating is not always good. It can worsen the condition. So how do you protect your skin in winter? Use mild soap and cleansers with neutral pH. Once a day bath only. The old habit of applying coconut oil or sunflower oil or castor oil in the skin. The grandma's recipe is really good. Continue to use that and apply it at least once a week or whatever you are doing, continue that and don't stop that. And after that, after bath, apply a lot of moisturizers, emollients on the face, limbs, body, and use it more frequently in winter, three to four times a day. All these measures will bring back your skin hydration and radiance. This is how you have to manage your skin in winter. Skin in the city. We're all exposed to pollution on a very daily basis, especially in urban areas. Dust in the air clogs the pores in the skin, increases acne. It increases the bacterial load of the skin and increases uh, the uh, bacterial infections. Chemical pollut pollutants also impair the skin barrier in function, aggravating the natural protection system and increase the eczema. So there are several conditions which we are exposed to in our day-to-day -day life, which can increase acne, eczema, psoriasis, allergies, skin infections, and cause early aging and cancer. These are definitely triggering and aggravating factors for so many of these conditions. These are some real-time India most polluted city ranking. I'll go to the next slide. This is more better. This was published by NDTV.com, where the most polluted cities in India, number one is in Rajasthan, Vivandi. Ghaziabad is number two, UP. This is a, the world figures, I think. No, this is the top 15 most polluted places out of which 10 in the world, out of which 10 are in India. The third is comes in China and Delhi is fourth, the most polluted city. This is the index, index. And uh, next uh, we have in UP, Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, Haryana. So most of these cities are in the north and they are around Delhi. You can see Delhi, UP, Haryana, Punjab. So these are the most polluted areas. Imagine the south, we are fairly spared. I think we are less polluted when compared to the north. In conclusion, it's uh, everyone's responsibility to promote uh, safe environments and addressing climate change. Physicians and medical societies need to educate the public at large on health hazards of uh, climate change. Doctors and our associations can use their voice to advocate for policy action to protect the patient health. So we can influence the governments on environmental issues by bringing out these health hazards, educating the public and the government as, in the whole, as a whole. I am sure every one of us will use safe environmental practice in our day-to-day -day life, whether it's in your residence, in your workplace, wherever you are, please use safe environmental practices to make this earth a better living space for our future generations to come. Thank you very much and thank you very much for the patient. Thank you.
you have any questions? Yeah. yeah. Any questions, please? Yes, the reason why we have written D deficiency is due to too much melatonin in the body. We don't know. We don't know why there is so much of vitamin D deficiency. Maybe because maybe one 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 factor is vegetarian food, right? Non-vegetarian food has more uh, vitamin D. Vegetarian, we are dependent on milk mainly. So the, a lot of adults do not take milk. Right, it's considered as baby food. So maybe so vitamin D deficiency is more common in uh, vegetarians. Don't think uh, uh, can be darker than other reasons. no, sir, no. Vitamin D, D synthesis is always less in the skin. It's not enough to provide uh, sufficient levels in the blood. Sir, uh, sir, uh, next. Uh, we can say we have seen in infancy that is in the first year of life also psoriasis yeah from infancy to senescence to elderly psoriasis can occur though i said there are two peaks 20 to 30 20 to 35 is the first peak the second peak actually happens in the elderly between 50 to 65 there are two peaks of psoriasis but it can occur at any age from infancy to uh, senescence. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, I don't know. Maybe the, uh, the factors, the uh, lifestyle habits and environmental changes also may be responsible. I don't know why exactly it's more common. Also genetic influences. Uh, these three factors might be contributing. So, yes, yes, in about 10 to 15 percent of the patients, we are able to find a positive family history. But you won't find a positive uh, family history in about 80 to 85 percent of the patients where the immunological factors come into play. Yes. Do you have any solution? Yeah, like I said, even between attacks of eczema, we to prevent recurrences or the delay the recurrences, we tell the patients to continue to use a lot of moisturizers to keep the skin hydrated always. That delays the second attack of eczema. And also we use some uh, topical agents like tacrolimus as weekend therapy, as maintenance ther therapy also. And also we have to look at all the triggering factors and try to manage that. Including the stress. Yeah, you know, no, even now we do that, yeah. sir. We do yeah. that. Um, like I like I showed some very chronic eczemas with a lot of thickening of the skin. If that is localized, then we give intralesional steroids so that. Uh, the, the healing is faster. In, uh, it is an anti-inflammatory agent, so it heals faster by those injections. So when the eczema is chronic and localized, even now we use intralesional steroids. We use, yeah, we inject into the skin. <laughs> yeah, even now we use it. Sir. Yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's why we have special moisturizers for the skin, for acne prone skin. So we have different moisturizers for the face, we have different moisturizers for the limbs. So we have non comedogenic, uh, mild moisturizers meant for seboric or oily skin, which will not block the pores and increase the acne. So we give separate moisturizers for both conditions. No, no, sir. It has to be applied on the skin. There are some companies which came out with oral moisturizers, uh, but uh, scientists have found, the publications have found that it is not of much use. So we have to use it uh, locally, that is topical. It is a good question. <laughs> so 
Yes, do please do that. <laughs> no, at least it won't uh, make you dehydrated, isn't it? Uh, from the others. I have a question. Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> Well, coming to the exposure to sunlight, grandmother used to say in rural areas always, in the baby, newborn baby gets jandis, physiological jandis, most of them will get it. Exposed to sunlight before 10 a.m. or after 4 p.m. That is, they break the jandis pigment, deposit it under the skin, make it into the fat soluble, to water soluble, it used to be excreted. That is the right term. But we do get vitamin D, you expose your child to the sun between 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. But skin problem is more dangerous that one. There is a controversy here, <laughs> that one. How can we solve this problem? That's why I said, uh, so uh, you have to, just by going around in the sun, you uh, will not always uh, get sufficient vitamin D. If you have a sun prone disease, if you have a sensitive skin and you are likely to tan or burn or get photosensitive light eruptions, then avoid sun or cover up as much as possible. Use sunscreens. We don't ask them to avoid it totally. It's impossible to avoid. Use pro adequate protective measures and then go out. That's what you tell me. Yes, sir. Steroids are like a double-edged weapon, right? So it has to be used judiciously under the care of the treating physician. So we give it only when it is absolutely required and when the patient needs it. In psoriasis, we never give oral steroids because when we draw it, it will cause a mass massive relapse. But in eczemas, when, when it becomes too much, when it becomes generalized, when it becomes too chronic, and we have to use it, we use oral steroids. There are also other alternatives to steroids, other immunosuppressives, which I mentioned, which can also be used. But steroids are a useful drug, but it has to be used uh, judiciously. And when you are using it in an adult, you have to monitor various uh, uh, parameters, including uh, your BP, the blood sugar, etc. Any other questions? No, sir. There, sorry, we never, uh, both for this atopic eczema improves with age and goes around. Whereas psoriasis can keep coming and going. It's not very high. Sometimes they go into remissions for several years. It don't, doesn't come back at all. But we always tell the patient, remember that we can uh, keep, you, keep it under control, but we cannot prevent it from coming back again. Right? There is no medicine to prevent it from coming back to cure it permanently, but we can give you a very good control and make you live a normal life. That is, that is the goal of this treatment. Well, if you convince the patient about it, then the patient is happy, very happy and will stick to your treatment problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very common is every patient will come, will ask, before they go out, they ask, so is there any uh, thing which I have to avoid in the food? And the commonest item they ask is brinjal. <laughs> but rarely have we seen uh, brinjal aggravating allergies. And even in allergic uh, skin disorders, none of this eczema and psoriasis, there's no diet at all, right? Extremely rare for eczema to where a, a food allergen is aggravating the condition, especially the eczema which I was talking about, the atopic eczema. In psoriasis, there is no role of diet in psoriasis. There are other allergic conditions like urticaria where there might be a small role for food, but that's 2% or less. So the dietary factors in allopathy have a minor role when compared to Ayurveda and other modes of therapy. Any other questions? Yes, uh, coming to the pets, you did mention about it. Uh, yes. Pets with the long hair tend to have more allergy and all those things. 
Uh, that mainly come from the saliva baker, the lick. The saliva get dry and it is aerosolized. That is respiratory allergy comes. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, the pets were playing outside. They bring the pollen, so they're deposited. These are all the two things rather than the hay. That's yeah. one thing. The uh, third thing is now that we are recommending the pet, pet therapy becoming a prominent yes. role to play, as you rightly yeah. pointed out. Emotional stress and children, instead of having a finger exercise, they take the dog outside, you tell them. And their asthma is very, very well controlled in those types exactly. of things, certain situations. Yes. It has been recommended best as a stress buster. Have one pet in your house so that you can also do exercise. And, uh, exactly. That's why I said in mild ex atopic eczemas, yes. we advocate uh, the parents to keep a pet, only a pet with less lander and uh, less hair. So if there are no questions, anything from the net? No questions in the net. Okay. If there are no questions, I sincerely thank you for coming over, giving a talk and uh, talking about uh, how best you can able to manage environmentally. In addition to that, many people in the code of the day to very hot water, they take bath. Yes. That is not good. So uh, earlier we used to have Uber Bachan in Iran Thirty. So tepid water type of thing. That is better than yes. cold weather. Which chill is there in Bangalore. Poor, more hot water. That becomes more skin problem. I think you did mention yes, about it. Is. I think it covered very well. As a matter of fact, environmental issues. How best you can able to manage, and how, when to use medicine, when not to use medication. Food is one of the entity. It may not be that entity in compared to psoriasis and all those things. And uh, once again, I sincerely thank. And I just. Uh, Request uh, Professor Srinivasan giving a token of our appreciation of debate and climate change. A small memento, sir. Now, I request uh, Dr. J. J. Rao, he is the past president of the Commonwealth uh, India branch, in India chapter, and also currently the coordinator for international national command. And he was the past president of the Bangalore Pedic Society. I think you name it, he has got in every way in hands, <laughs> in every pie, he has got a finger. And he's a very committed person, less spoken, more he believes in action than in uh, talking. I request him to give a word of thanks on behalf of the Comrade and the Devices and Climate Change Electric Education Trust. Good evening. I am really very happy to see this good crowd because the, the skin attracts a lot. You know, the reasons in uh, early 70s, I got uh, MD seat in you know, dermatology. Somehow, I thought uh, no, it doesn't fit to my uh, mind, mindset. Now, looking at this uh, dermatologists who are doing extremely well, there are so many reasons. One, there are no emergency and there are no deaths. <laughs> they, they can go and sleep after seeing the patient. <laughs> Whereas in my case or Parmesh case, we go to bed with a lot of problems in the head. <laughs> so we may get any time, any calls. And mothers always keep on calling and pasting. Child is crying, no fever, fever is not subsided, that this is not one question. Anyway, uh, I thank him profusely. He covered uh, extensively skin problem in both pediatrics and adults and related with uh, particularly in relation with this psoriasis. Psoriasis is one of the toughest disease in the skin department. It's very, very, very difficult. Recurrence rate is very high and even eczema also. He highlighted in a beautiful way. I hope you people are enjoyed. Looking at this uh, crowd today, Ladies are more because this cosmetic pur pur purpose <laughs> this is what I feel. Any small pimple, they go to dermatologist. You know? Uh, anyway, 
so thank you sir on behalf of the uh, comrade india chapter and on behalf of uh, uh, devesha center uh, uh, once again thank you very much